Thank you for attending this virtual program. It's been very interesting putting it together. And big thank you to um, Austin, who's uh, definitely helping out with the situation right now uh, from the library. And I'm gonna flip over to the presentation. Okay, all right, I hope everyone can see that. So, all right, now let's get started for real. All of that uh, icky, is the tech working? I'm not sure, is this thing on? It, it's over with, we're gonna get into it. So thank you, genealogists, family historians, interested parties, anyone out there who's tuning in right now, hope you're staying safe and healthy at home. And I know you're also, if you're inclined to, do, to doing genealogy research, you've probably been doing a bit of that because nothing can stop a genealogist or a family historian. So I hope you'll learn a few things from this tonight. Um, this is definitely something you can make use of with your time right now, because we're going to be talking about the Digital Library for Genealogical Research. And it's with me, and my name's Kara Tucker. I'm a reference librarian in the Genealogy and Local History Department. So maybe um, I've helped you before, maybe I've helped you via email. If you're curious, yeah, it's Kara. It looks kind of funny, but that's who I am. And I love helping people do research. I think it's a blast. So today we're gonna to talk about a number of things. Here's the overview of the presentation for today. So we're gonna talk about accessing the digital library. I'm going to go over some great collection highlights that might be of particular interest to genealogists. While we're doing that, I'm gonna go over some tips and tricks that will hopefully make navigating the website a little bit easier because it's not always the easiest. I'll be the very first person to say that, um, but genealogy takes patience. I like to tell people, um, it took your ancestors lifetimes to create these records that we're looking for and you're not gonna find them in an afternoon, but this should hopefully occupy a few of your afternoons. We'll do a little bit of live demonstration, not a whole lot because I was concerned about how well you can see my screen. It might be kind of small and pointing out different things when you're looking for a tiny cursor might be a little difficult. Um, and then now uh, we'll have a little bit of Q&A. Hopefully that will work well. That's the one part where it's definitely might be a moment of, is this thing on again? But thank you for your patience. I appreciate it. All right, so first of all, we're going to access the digital library. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you don't need a library card. You just need a device that has an internet connection. However, on that note, with the next slide, I'll point out that you can get a digital library card if you don't already have one. It's on a big box on the website right now. You'll see it next to that um, little triangle, all library locations closed, etc. If you don't have a card already, click on that link and it'll walk you through it. And if you do, there are instructions for how you can um, get to your account information uh, so that if you do have a card already, hey, you can use some other databases that we have because right now it's pretty cool. You can get to Ancestry Library from home. That's awesome. And a ton of other stuff too, but we don't need it for this time. So we're interested in the digital library right now. And that's where it lives on the main page. Definitely keep an eye out for these big yellow arrows. Um, and now that I'm thinking of it, I'll also mention later on toward the end of the presentation, if um, some of this might be difficult to see on your screen, there will be a link, and I believe Austin is also sharing it, um, to a, uh, a PDF of this presentation. So if something's difficult to see on your screen, definitely get that, but hopefully that'll help too. And I think you can watch this on replay as well. So keep an eye out for those big yellow arrows as we're going through. Okay, so here we are. Welcome to the digital library. It's that simple. You go to cincinnatilibrary.org, you click on the digital library, here we are. So you'll see when you first arrive, this is a very zoomed in screenshot, um, but you'll see different tiles of different collections that we have available. Um, oops. And I like to browse. I think it's a lot of fun to find some of the things we have in the digital library that I might not have realized. So we're gonna talk a lot about that because everybody wants to go up to that search box up there on the top right and just start typing in names and hope something shows up. It doesn't always work that way, unfortunately. It would be cool if it did, but Ancestry and other um, databases like that are set up a little differently than the digital library is. So we'll talk about that in depth as well, but here we are, welcome. All right, so now collection highlights. These are things that genealogists definitely shouldn't miss or also jumping off points 
for other parts of the collection that you might not find otherwise by doing a simple search. And also just some pretty cool stuff that we've added maybe fairly recently or that we've worked with other places to put on. The digital library has a lot of different things, little quick, very, it, this is not an exhaustive list by any measure, but there are our historic records, there are our photo materials, newspapers, online exhibits. You can check out the daguerreotype uh, digitally on the digital library. Um, lots of really neat things, but we're gonna focus more on those types of records that are going to be helpful, of course, to filling out all the leaves and branches on your tree. Maybe not all, but it'll get you a little closer. Okay, so I'm also going to briefly talk about some of the concepts that, of the tips and tricks as we're talking about the highlights of the collection. I'm going to show you how to do things like download something to your computer, which uh, is a frequently asked question. A lot of these are derived from um, just questions people frequently have about the digital library and when I'm helping them. Or they could be something that in my own research I found to be particularly useful when I'm browsing or searching. So we'll talk about that, um, asking for help, how you can browse collections. This is just sort of an idea, a general idea of what I'll talk about as we're going through each of the cool parts of the digital library. First of all, of course, the most popular are city and county directories. So if you're a genealogist and you've been doing this for a while, this is going to be review. This is the cake part of the course. This is old hat. That's awesome. And I love that people know about them and use them like crazy. That's why we have them on um, the digital library. But what's really exciting is you might not be aware is that we have them available all the way from, you know, the first one in 1819 through 1950 now, which is so awesome. So that might be new news to you, but for if we have anybody who's new or just getting their feet wet with, ge with genealogy, this is definitely something you don't want to miss and something as someone with very rural ancestors, boy, do I wish that every town and small county and what have you in the entire country had these because they are a wonderful resource. You can find those by looking at the arrow right there in city and county directories if you want to browse them. And I'll also mention too, I've got the little yellow arrow up there at the top. We're on page one of when you first arrive at the digital library. There are more collections farther in. Um, definitely make sure you're clicking through pages two and three because there might be a direct way to get to a specific collection that you'd like to see. Um, so it's not just one page, make sure you keep clicking. All right, so the city and county directories, if you're not familiar with them, they kind of work like a modern phone book does today, alphabetical order names. They might tell you um, what a person did for a living. It, uh, later ones may give a spouse's name. For um, widowed women, it may list them as well, just with widow or WID as an abbreviation, which if you're not sure when someone died, that might get you as a hint a little closer to figuring out the date which is always nice. Uh, business addresses, that kind of thing. They change as different pieces of history uh, influence them. So later ones will maybe note if someone owned a telephone uh, that might tell you the status if they're a homeowner, if they're a boarder, a renter, that kind of thing. So they're great for putting a person in a place and time. Later versions of the city directory, so starting in the 19 teens, or later ones, uh, the crisscross directory shows up. So if you're trying to find an address that your uh, maybe family lived in, or even if you're doing house history research too, if you hop to the later half of the book, which it's usually if you're physically holding a copy of it, it's kind of a different color and you can see it. So for these, you'd wanna go pretty far into the volume if you want to browse. And this, for instance, um, shows an example of Mills Avenue. And it has a list of all the addresses and the people um, who were living at those addresses. It's really neat. It's alphabetical by street. Okay, so here's a search tip. The number one, not number one, rank number one, but the first for city and county directories. Something that I like to do because as much as I talk about, well, you know, it takes a little while to find things sometimes. Oh boy, am I impatient. I, not a big fan of paging through the city directories on the digital library. I like to take just like a couple minutes to download the directory to my computer because it'll let me page through it like a PDF. So that way I'm, if I'm looking for the last name Smith, I can, you know, grab the little scroll bar and go right to it. Or, it, and this is nice in Cincinnati because there are some very unique surnames 
I mean, Smith is a pretty common one, and I use it as an example a lot because you're always going to find a Smith. But if you t hit your, um, if you're on a Mac, if you hit Command and the letter F, or if you're on a PC and you hit Control and the letter F, a little box is going to show up somewhere on your screen. And I have this PDF downloaded to my computer. I hit Command F, and this little box on the top right popped up. That means the F stands for find. So it's gonna find whatever you type into that box, exactly. So I typed in Mills and Mills Avenue popped up. So say I was looking for that on the page and I couldn't figure out where it was, it'll take you to every instance of it. So in th this situation, it found it six times. So this is the first out of six. And you can use this on websites, PDFs, anything where the computer can read the text, it'll be able to do that for you. And you, you can hop right to something a lot quicker. Number two is use the advanced search. I use it when I wanna go straight to a specific year in the city directory a lot of the time. You can, you go to advanced search, you can pick the collection you'd like to look at. You can show all of them. You could say, no, I just want the city directories. I just want genealogy and local history, whichever. So you check that box. If you wanna uncheck them, you uncheck, select all collections, save it and then type in your keywords. So I might type in Cincinnati City Directory as my keyword, and I want all of those words in the search. And if you go to enter date, it will let you pick on, after, before, or between. So if you wanted to search a date range, you could put those numbers in, or say you want just 1918, you could say, okay, I want you to find the city directory for 1918, and it should show up in your search results. All right, so that was just a very quick overview of the city directories. Again, they go up to 1950 now, so exciting. And we're gonna talk next about the genealogy and local history collection, which is huge and has so much cool stuff on it. All right, so my first tip is to browse. I like to browse and read about collections a lot of the, a lot of the time because as genealogists, we know every single time you go to a new website or a new database or a new collection, it's always organized differently or you're not sure what date it covers or where on earth did it come from or what other context can I figure out? Browsing will help you do that rather than going straight up to that very simple search box because if you're browsing by clicking on this collection and looking at it, you also um, can read about the collection and related collections and as another tip, Scroll down. There's way more information possibly waiting for you at the bottom if you have, like me, my screen is really small. So when I'm looking at that collection, it doesn't look like there's anything else beneath it, but there could be. So beneath where it has related collections, you can look at all of the items in the collection too. And moving on to tip number three, and this isn't for every collection in the digital library, but this one's great because it also breaks things down by subject. And that can be a fun way of finding um, new materials or new research items that you might not have organically um, browsed. So search tip number four for the collection is to find collections with contents that might not appear in text search results. So um, I'll talk about this a little bit more in depth later, but um, not everything uh, is, computers can't read handwriting very well yet. So we're going to look at an example from the um, indigent burial records, which are such a great collection because they pick up uh, um, information about people who may have been kind of like in the corners of society or in a marginalized part of um, the community. And there might not be a ton of newspaper articles written about them. You might not find them in the city directory because they had to move so often. Lots of different reasons. So um, these are folks who didn't, you know, they didn't have a family plot for them in Spring Grove or they couldn't afford a burial or, you know, many other reasons. And it's such a valuable resource because this might be one of the only occasions where you could find information about someone. Let's zoom in a little closer. So this shows, for example, we know according to this burial record that William Coldwell was interred um, on the 21st of January of 1902. So this would be the cemetery off Gurley Road, if I'm saying that correctly, um, where um, it's very much a overgrown kind of tree um, area now, and you're not necessarily going to be able to go out and find where these burials are, but you can at least confirm that they're buried there. And in this instance, maybe you're, you've been looking for William, but you haven't found maybe an official death record for him. Perhaps his name has been indexed wrong, or 
some other variety of reasons for why occasionally it's hard to find um, certain kinds of vital records. Well, now you can say, well, you know he was interred that on that date. That gets you a little closer to maybe a death date too. And it tells you a little bit about him as well. Not sure what grave number eight means in this context, unfortunately, uh, but they're a really wonderful resource. So the tricky thing about William as well, some of this collection's available on index cards and it's, those are scanned and are part of it as well. And the computer will pick up that information, but it won't pick up this handwritten stuff. And those don't always totally, um, I guess, connect. So not every single name that's handwritten always shows up when you type it in a search. For example, when we search for a William Coldwell, we get no results. So search tip number five is be skeptical. If you have really good reason to believe that you know that a person was maybe associated with a church record uh, or a church that has records in this collection, or you have reason to believe they were probably buried there. It couldn't hurt to browse the volume and the year that you're looking for just to be sure because you never know. Be skeptical, be tenacious. That's, uh, I know that's usually, those are hallmarks of genealogists. So keep digging always. All right, now I'm gonna just quickly go over some other kind of cool stuff in the collection. Um, some things that are maybe newer, some that aren't. The uh, Longview Asylum annual reports are fairly new to the digital library. Now they're not going to have the names of you know, every patient that um, was there, but they do give some really interesting historical context to if you found out that perhaps um, you had a relative who was a patient there, or if you're just interested in the subject in general from maybe a local history perspective. This is uh, just a page from the 1861 um, issue of it, and it's interesting. It, it's kind of statistical information that breaks um, the patients down by occupation. Um, next is a case record of children admitted to the House of Refuge. This is one of those hybrid situations, again, where there is some information, like an index, that relates to the contents of the book that are, the computer can read that text can't read that handwriting. So it might find what you need, but if you search and you're like, well, why isn't my relative showing up when I search for them? It couldn't hurt just to kind of check that uh, text for yourself and take a peek, just to be on the safe side. Because how cool would it be, and this is just a zoomed in version of the previous page, uh, to find out that, you know, this is your relative. Um, it says on this day, uh, this day is uh, one of interest, is being one on which the first boy admitted as an inmate is indentured. Francis Harvey, since his entering the institution, has behaved himself in a very becoming and gentlemanly manner, etc. And it may explain where that person ended up, other people um, that you can search for that maybe they um, lived with to help you um, perhaps break down a brick wall because uh, that seems like a wonderful bunch of hints right there to me, especially as you keep going and you find other names in the text. Also, the First German Protestant Association of Avondale, um, the cemetery record books are really great. I was just browsing around looking for some fun examples to show, and I selected that I wanted only results that were from 1841 to 1850. And this was one that popped up, and it's one that, that is used and people ask about. So I thought, oh, I should put that in there too, because everybody's always looking for cemetery records and burial records, and I'm a big fan of those because they're pretty cool. And something I'll show you with this little quick extra hint too while we're at it. Again, scroll down like we learned before. If you find this, and again, this is volume two, and you're like, well, wait a minute, I need volume four or a different volume. Where is that? I don't even remember how I got here. How did I end up here? Who has not said that to themselves while doing research? This is a way for you to kind of find your way to more information that might exist that was created by the same, um, in this instance, it's referred to as an author. So scroll down and look at that object description stuff. A lot of it's gonna be kind of make your eyes cross librarian type stuff. But if you click where it says author, it's going to give you results that anything that has that particular um, group or person or institution as the author. And here we go. There are seven uh, record books total that have that listed as the author. And now you can get to volume number four. There it is right there at the top. So try that too, a little extra tip in there. The voter registration lists are also another really good resource. 
for finding people in a time and a place. Here we have uh, Ward 1, Precinct H, alphabetical order for folks in 1931. So it gives their, their name and their address. And it also has women too. You don't always find uh, women listed outright in the city directory. All right, maps and atlases. This is going to be very, very quick because we could talk about maps and atlases for a really long time. Um, but I know that they are great resources for seeing where your relatives lived or trying to understand where you're looking for uh, maybe a church nearby. Say you are not sure where to look for a baptismal record and you're like, well, I'm not sure which church they might have gone to. You could try looking for a map that could perhaps have that listed and, and proximity might help. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. That's just an, a random example. But those are located here. I think this is on page two. So those little numbers that were at the top, we'd click on two and find it there. And search tip number one for maps and atlases, and this kind of goes for everything as well. Uh, read the collection descriptions. I know I want to click in really fast and find my stuff super fast, but sometimes the collection description can help you figure out if what you're about to look at is really going to be helpful or not, especially if there's a date range listed and the date you're looking for is definitely not included in that. It might be worth exploring anyway, um, but it also tells you um, just more about the collection in general, just to give you an idea of what you're about what fun you're about to get into. All right, search tip number two for these. I, like I said before, am super impatient, and I mentioned downloading city directories earlier. I like to look at maps on my computer rather than the viewer sometimes, and it's sometimes a little bit slow, and I find it faster just to download maps, especially when it comes to, um, even though the Sanborns are huge, I like to download the title page and like the, um, the visual index and search it I think it works pretty well that way for me. But the big yellow arrow is pointing to the download icon. When you click on that, it will have a little, um, a little drop down menu that will appear that will say, do you wanna you know, download this item or all? And with something that is multi-page, for instance, this is a part of the screen, but from a Sanborn map, you, if you wanted to do just whatever it is that you're looking at on the left-hand pane, so in this instance, it's in yellow, it would be the title page, you would do um, just this item. Because if you click all, it's going to download the entire thing, which can be good if that's what you want, but if it's not, don't click it. And then just to the right of that is a print icon where you can do the exact same thing. You can print either just the item you're looking at or, <laughs> and I hope you have a lot of color ink um, all, or if you know how to cancel really quickly because that would be a lot of paper. So proceed with caution, especially when it comes to printing icons. All right, search tip number three um, is augment your digital library research with other databases. So the Sanborn maps that we have online are all going to be uh, ones that are in uh, the, um, uh, public domain, there's a word. Um, so you're, well, we, there, well, there won't be later ones, but we don't have some of the earlier ones either, but there are access to earlier ones. If you go to um, the history section of the research and homework databases area, there's good stuff in genealogy for you to use. There's also good stuff under history. This one just falls under history. So you'll find some earlier ones that they're not going to be the really beautiful full color ones that we have on the digital library. They'll be in black and white, but they're for all of Ohio. So you can get to um, other areas, which is great because ours are, we have lots of different parts of the region included in the maps, but you can go all over the place and it, all over Ohio anyway, with that resource. You will need your library card for it, but as we can see right now, get a digital library card. There it is right on the screen. Make sure you get one of those if you don't have one already. And you can check earlier maps that they have available on there too, which is lovely. Sanborns are wonderful, and if you're not familiar with them, you're gonna have a great time exploring them because they show so much cool detail when they're in color. They tell you, you know, what buildings are made of based on the color. Um, you can see what kind of material a roof of a house was made out of. It's, it just helps a lot to maybe better understand where your um, ancestors were living and, and what their neighborhood was like. All right, newspapers on the digital library. These are in a lot of different places. I'll show, for instance, here are two collections on one of the pages. 
We have the African American Society columns and the Catholic Telegraph that just show up here, but there are more than that. A few of them, um, we've been adding the court index and we will be adding uh, the precursor, the law bulletin soon too. These are really neat. We're doing that um, in conjunction with the um, Hamilton County Law Library, which is awesome, which you can see the stamp across the top. Um, my colleague Steve Headley has been working on the African American Society columns, which are a really great resource. Um, they span between 1884 and 1896, and they're clippings from the Commercial Gazette, the Inquirer, um, the Time Star, um, that cover just different events and people in the African American community in Cincinnati. Uh, they created them to try to dr drum up some more readership but they, uh, they're a really wonderful resource with a ton of rich history that might not have other been, uh, otherwise been covered. And those are text searchable too because they've all been made with uh, good old movable type from that time frame. So you should be able to type in something in your search and have these contents appear. And so the different, all the different collections that they fall under are um, Catholic Telegraph, magazines and newspapers, Cincinnati Court Index is one that's just kind of out there that you have to find, but it shows up in a ton of results. And African American Society columns are a, a sec, uh, their own section too. So the type is really tiny. That is a challenge with newspapers. You are going to want to expand to view when you find something, if something great comes up in your search results. So if you follow the yellow arrow, make sure you click on that little expander in the gray and you'll be able to see things a lot better. You'll also be able to search tip two for these. Not only will it get bigger when you do that, you can zoom in and out with the plus and minus signs. And if you want to search something in here too, you can use the magnifying glass, which is so confusing. I get that. <laughs> sometimes the magnifying glass magnifies, sometimes it searches. Inconsistency in technology, isn't it fun? But if you click that magnifying glass, oops, a little search box will pop up just as if you would hit Control F or Command F, which you can also use in this instance too. You'll type in the word that you're looking for to show up on the page and it should highlight it for you. Church records collection, tip number one, use the boxes on the left to narrow down results. Those can be keywords, um, those can be maybe a time frame. In this instance, I know especially when it comes to church records <clears throat> collections, we're going to have things included like bulletins, uh, cabinet cards, photographs, things that are wonderful pieces of uh, genealogy, um, genealogical history and local history too, but you might want to get straight to those records and you can kind of push the other things aside for the moment, check on those later and go straight to just the records that won't show up in search results because they're handwritten by going down to format and clicking on uh, books in this instance. So we won't see any photographs, we won't see clippings, we will just find results after we click on that that are books, record books related to, um, that are within that collection. So rather than having, you know, 14 pages of results to sift through, you only have a few. And then you would just find, of course, the time frame relevant to when your uh, relative was in the area or attended that um, church and page through the book and find some great stuff. And of course, check back re regularly, especially with this collection. New items are being, well, <laughs> will be being added when things happen again. And that goes for a number of other collections too. We scan uh, thousands of pages of things and put stuff online all the time. So if you don't see something today, you might see something tomorrow or in a couple months. It's funny how a lot of digital genealogy works like that now is you do it, can't find anything, you hop to another branch, you check back again and you know, once you're okay with looking for those relatives again who keep uh, being really difficult to find and boom, first search, there it is because something was added in the last you know, week or two. All right, we're gonna do a tips and tricks overview. Some things that uh, we've learned while looking at some really great genealogy resources on the digital library. Those were downloading items, uh, using Control F or Command F to find stuff on a page much faster. Um, you can browse handwritten items because they're not necessarily going to show up in your search results. Uh, using the advanced search, um, 
ask for help. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we do a Q&A, which I hope works. I guess we'll, that will really be the test of the tech when we try to do that part. Um, and very, very quickly, um, I'm gonna go over a couple of other ways you can perhaps use uh, different searches or search engines to find items on the digital library. If you're browsing our catalog, for instance, if you click the tab digital library, um, your search results will show you items that are available there. So if I had the catalog tab selected, it would be showing different results. But in this instance, we get this list of those German Protestant um, cemetery records and you'll see the media file link. And if you click on that, it'll take you to where it is in the digital library. So you might bump into something that way, or if you're just more comfortable with it, give that a shot. And one of my favorite things to do is to make Google do the work, because why not? This works for pretty much any website that has text on it. And you can tell Google. All right, so you'll type into Google or your search uh, bar in your browser if you have Google set to your primary search engine. Site colon digital dot Cincinnati library dot org, or you could, you know, put in a different website. Um, and then you'll put a space and your search terms after that. So you're telling Google that you wanted to search that website for the search terms Cincinnati City Directory. 1918 Smith, because we don't want to browse through, we don't want to click on collections. We want to know, can Google just find the page that has Smith on it from the 1918 Cincinnati City Directory? Well, it can. So the top result doesn't look quite like what I want it to, because I can tell that it looks like a bunch of other random names and I don't see Smith right off the bat. Ah, but the second one, has Smith hyphen continued, which is often at the top of a page of a city directory when it's a, such a common name that it spans more than one page. So clicking on that takes you straight here. Here we are, the page with Smith from the 1918 Cincinnati city directory. That simple. And then if for, maybe it's not Clifford you're looking for, but um, Albert, all you would do is use the little side arrows to page back and forth. You can see that um, arrow on the right hand side. I hope you, if you can see my cursor, that would take you a page forward, but it's just a screenshot, so it doesn't work. All right, so this is, <laughs> might be uh, an interesting moment. This is when I realized that I had been disconnected last time because I thought, oh, okay, let's see how the live demonstration is gonna go. And I looked down and went, oh goodness, I'm no longer connected to anyone. So this, I'm gonna do this one really quickly so we can get to Q&A because, because thanks to some technical issues, we're about to go over. So I'm gonna click my link here. It's gonna take me to the digital library. And I'm going to resist temptation to click in that simple search box and just start typing in what I'm looking for because I've learned some tips and tricks on how to use this maybe more effectively. Instead, I'm going to click advanced search and I know how tiny the screen is. That's why rather than this being live and because sometimes things can be a little slow, I did a bunch of screenshots and a PowerPoint. I'm not sure how well you can see my screen. So hopefully you can see what I'm talking about. I'm going to click advanced search, which takes us to the advanced search page. And from here I could look for through all of the collections or tell it to. You can click show all, it lists everything. So if you wanted to search a particular one, you would click on select all collections because that unselects them and then you'd pick what you'd like to look at. In this instance though, I wanna search everything and I'm gonna click show less, get that out of the way. All right, and if you changed it, you'd have to hit save. In this instance, I don't need to because it's already looking for everything. All right, let's look for um, that. There's always a Robert Smith. So we're going to look for a Robert J. Smith, that's a common enough name. And we're going to do all of the words. You can do exact phrase. I'm not going to do that in this instance because it might not, um, the things like city directories, it's like, well, wait a minute, maybe the name's backwards or uh, it's listed as Smith Robert J or something like that. So I'm not gonna do exact in this instance, but I will change it to, let's do between, let's say you had, a a relative by that name in Cincinnati between 1890 and, oh, let's just look for them 
for 10 years to 1900. All right. And here are our search results. So the very first is an annual report from the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce. I'm gonna click that, take a look at it. All right, so something that can become very confusing and it's kind of annoying, I agree, um, is you're like, okay, well, cool. You told me there was a Robert Smith here and I don't see him on this page and this page is really small. Very first thing that I usually do to search the contents of something like this is if you look over to the right hand side where it says search this record, it's searching Robert J. Smith or that time frame. I'm just gonna delete that or and hit search again and see this highlighted page is what's showing up here and that's super tiny. So let's make that bigger by clicking on that gray expander arrow. And, oh, what do you know? There's Robert J. Smith. I'm gonna zoom in using that plus sign that we saw earlier. Scroll down, there he is. So he was on a committee on quotations for record of prices for the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce. So if that were my relative, I'd be super stoked that he did something related to groceries. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what that means with this record, but that could be a, a pretty cool thing to maybe learn about and it might bring you even more hints because we're always looking for hints um, about a learning not just you know who our relatives were and when they died and when they lived but what were they doing what were they doing that whole time and this might give you an idea to search for him related to the chamber of commerce and in the newspapers and you could find even more great information out about him so that's just a quick live demo we will go back to here. So, okay, this might take a second. Um, questions and answers. Hopefully you have questions and hopefully I have answers. This might take a second and I know we, it's nine o'clock right now, but give me just a second. You're gonna get to look at me again while I check something to see if I can take a look at any questions you might have? Has everybody been using Ancestry Library at home too, I hope? It's really cool being able to do that. And um, is there any really neat thing anybody's found in the digital library? Oh, a library card question. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> um, so I'm not a guru of such things, but um, you don't, you, you, well, here's the thing. So if you live in any of the Northern Kentucky counties that are part of the Swan um, uh, reciprocity kind of thing, so if you have a Boone, Kenton, or Campbell card, you can also get a Hamilton County Library card. And if you're a resident of any part of Ohio, you can too. Hopefully that is correct. I don't get a whole lot of card questions, um, but if you go back to, let's switch back to my screen. Let's check out the website where it will give you more information about getting a card. So library cards are free to applicants of any age who meet any of the following criteria. If you're a resident of Ohio, uh, associated with the regional library system as a card holder, etc. So check out that page. That's gonna tell you everything you need to know. And at the bottom here, it says existing card holders. If you need to renew your card or uh, maybe half of the number scratched off your key fob, you can call. I'm not sure if it's, we're open for phones at this hour because we've gone so late, but um, you can call 513-369-6900 and a person will be able to help you out because we're still out here. We, okay, so question, do you have city uh, Cincinnati directories or are there other cities? There are other cities. I'm gonna toggle back over to the digital library. So give me just a second.
Okay, so if we go to that city and counties directories, I hope you can see it. Maybe I'll zoom in with my screen a little bit. Again, that scroll down is so valuable because you'll see other cities in Ohio listed and also coming to Newport in Kentucky. So you can look at um, county directories too, so it's not just cities. So here's Dayton, for instance. Ah, that didn't work. <laughs> we'll have to fix that. Um, but, oh, you know what? We'll do advanced search. So let's do city directory Dayton. And hopefully, hopefully we'll get a result. Oh, there we go. Dayton city directory for 1876. So there we go. We found something. <laughs> All right, back to me again. Let's see. I'll check and see if we have any more questions. It sounds like it's raining again. I'm here for, with answers, hopefully. If there are any other questions, please let me know. don't know what to talk about it in these weird little spaces. All right, cool. So that sounds like all the questions we have. That's awesome. Thank you very much for um, tuning in. I'm going to flip back over to the last couple of slides I have for the presentation because I, if you'd like to download a PDF of it, you can go to this link, which I believe has been shared um, with the event uh, by Austin. So you can Go straight there and download the PDF. Or if you have, get my name out of the way, um, if you have a more in-depth question that maybe isn't about the digital library, give us a shout out. Send us an email, history at cincinnatilibrary.org, and we are answering questions. So please send us uh, a message. We won't be able to search for uh, anything that's in the physical reference collection, of course, but we will do our best to see what we can find. It's, uh, it's really nice having that ancestry access. And I have digital library access, of course, too, and all the other databases you can get to as well. So um, I think that's it. I thank you very much for watching, especially if you've continued through um, some of the, the trials of trying out new tech. This is a brand new situation and setup, so I appreciate it. I really do. Um, good luck with all of your research. I hope you fill out every last leaf on your family tree. Um, but I think that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night.